when secular newspapers print screaming headlines about killer viruses and plagues of locusts. It's time for the sleepy, out-of-touch church to wake up. The gospel good news is that history as we know it will soon culminate in the second coming of Jesus. The Jerusalem Channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching. If you've ever wanted to spend time in Jerusalem, the perfect occasion and some of the nicest weather happens during the great biblical feast of Passover. This is your invitation to join me in Israel from the 11th to the 16th of April. We'll be in the Holy City for Resurrection Sunday with time for worship and touring before we travel to the Galilee and hold a prophetic Passover supper in the Bible village of Cana. Each day we'll have special guest speakers and time of fellowship, prayer, and healing. For details to register, visit our website at exploits.tv. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg. It's amazing to me that so many churches are fast asleep when even the secular newspapers are cataloging end time signs about locusts, earthquakes, and pestilences. Jesus said when describing to his disciples the scenario of the last days, see to it that nobody deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming, I'm the Messiah. And the time is near, but don't follow them. And when you hear of wars and rebellions, don't be alarmed, Jesus said. These things must happen first, but the end is not yet. Then he told his disciples in Mark 13, 8, that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These, he said, are the beginning of birth pains. Luke 21.11 adds the word pestilences, as well as earthquakes and famines. And there has been much alarm recently about viruses. Think about this. A pregnancy lasts nine months, but the labor pains last only two to eight hours, generally speaking. So when they come, the end is very near. Soon the birth happens. Contractions become longer, stronger, and closer together. Nothing is going to slow down events now. They will speed up until Jesus returns. Recently, one newspaper article claimed to outline 10 plagues happening in our world simultaneously. Giant swarms of locusts devastating entire regions of Africa and Asia, while extremely unusual storms are confounding meteorologists, and earthquake and volcanic activity are both on the rise in addition to up to five dangerous viruses breaking out across the globe. Indeed, my news feed has been full of photos of armies of locusts swarming from the Horn of Africa, reportedly all the way to China. Billions of these insects have destroyed food supplies in what's been described as the worst plague for decades along both sides of the Red Sea. Now, in the Bible, locusts have always been an image of terror. Their destruction of crops has often signaled locusts as being agents of God's judgment against nations. In the book of Exodus, a plague of locusts was one of ten punishments which befell Egypt for having enslaved the Jewish people. Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all day and night. And by morning, the wind had brought the locusts. The great locust army invaded Egypt, and never before had there been such a plague of locusts. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the previous plague that God sent of hail. Everything growing in the fields and the fruit on the trees was devastated. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. 
Now today, the parallels between the biblical plague and its modern counterpart are evident. According to various reports, the current plague of locusts occurred after a period of heavy rain drenching their breeding grounds. And according to the UN, desert locusts can travel up to 95 miles a day and one square kilometer swarm can devour as much food as 35,000 people can eat in a single day. The United Nations locust expert has warned that the next three months will be critical to bring the plague under control before the summer breeding starts. Well, whenever we see locusts in the news, it's a picture, a harbinger, a reminder. Let's call it a prophetic sign of the approaching end times and the second coming of Jesus. And as a Bible teacher, I'm prompted to look at Revelation chapter 9, verse 7, a verse that describes an end time scenario when giant locusts are described like horses prepared for battle. In fact, the resemblance of locusts to horses, especially in the head, has been noted many times. The resemblance is even more distinct when horses are made ready for battle because the hard shell or scales of the locusts resemble armor. But what's going on now is child's play compared to what's coming during the period known in the Bible as the Great Tribulation in the end times. In Revelation chapter 9, great plagues are unleashed on the earth for a limited time. And during this period, these supernatural horse-like locusts will descend on the earth and they'll be given power like scorpions to torment earth dwellers. That's what the Bible teaches. Meanwhile, during the present birth pains leading up to the second coming, the earth is convulsing with bizarre weather, devastating storms, forcing mass evacuations, leaving people homeless, fires out of control, unprecedented flooding. And some of these recent upheavals have come home to many of us or to our loved ones, not to mention the increasing number of earthquakes occurring more frequently. Indeed, as Jesus said, like birth pains. And the earthquakes often result in dangerous tsunamis and trigger volcanic eruptions as well. In fact, seismic activity has been rising all over the globe. It used to be that going on a cruise was a wonderful way to relax, but now there's the increasing possibility of being stuck in quarantine on a cruise ship. But of course, even worse is coming down with a dangerous virus with the potentiality of becoming the worst global pandemic since the influenza of 1918, which was one of the most deadly epidemics in human history that killed a hundred million people. Other bird flu viruses are threatening lives and a strain of the bird flu that caused a massive global scare a number of years ago is now experiencing a resurgence. And while all of these health concerns are happening, we certainly are facing a serious moral decline and crisis as well. Take, for example, the attempt of evangelist Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, to hold a series of gospel meetings in the UK. Because of his biblical views, Franklin Graham has been blocked from hiring various venues. But Graham's not a quitter. He's still working on alternative venues and training course initiatives. But, he said, we have to face the fact that the world has changed dramatically since his father last preached in Scotland in 1991. Now, people who hold biblical views are being told that their views are no longer worthy of respect. Discrimination against Christians is growing and jobs are being lost. Church membership has also declined. Morality is falling. Principles are being diluted. The institution of marriage is besieged. Godless secularism is permeating all levels of society, including some churches. However, Franklin Graham said, although much in society has changed, the solution to the world's problems nevertheless remains the same. And I agree. The answer to all our troubles is faith in God through His Son, Jesus, the Messiah. That's the timeless hope of the gospel. All of these signs and birth pains happening simultaneously 
the moral degeneration, earthquakes, pestilences, and so forth, should make us wake up and look up, for our redemption is drawing nigh. Jesus is coming. The rapture is nearer today than ever before. To have a proper worldview, we must absorb what the Bible teaches about the future of this world. Billionaires are talking about how they're going to have to skyrocket out of this planet in order to survive, as if this world is just going to deteriorate without the direct intervention of the second coming of Jesus. But Jesus spoke of the end of the world, and so does this Bible. In the book of Genesis, God gave us an account of the creation of the world of the universe. And in the prophets and in the gospels and the epistles of the New Testament and the book of Revelation, we're also given explicit accounts of the renovation of this universe. Jesus taught that he would first return to earth for those who are born again believers and take us off to a special place, his father's house, where he's been busy preparing for us for the past two millennia. And then he will return again with his church, with his bride, to rule this world and put everything right, renovate. And when will all of this happen? Well, no one knows the exact time except God. But Jesus spoke of key events and signs that would alert his followers to know that the time of his appearing is near. He said that after the gospel of the kingdom has been preached to all nations, then he will return. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 details his return in the atmosphere known to theologians as an event called the rapture. Well, I've frequently and carefully mentioned, just so, so that people will understand, the specific word rapture isn't found in the English Bibles. But the fact that the word rapture is not found in the English Bible doesn't delegitimize the doctrine. After all, the form of the word is found in the Latin Bible. But its simple meaning is to be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord. And that concept is definitely in this Bible, no matter what language it's printed in. The concept or doctrine is called the rapture for want of a better word. Perhaps translation is a better word. There will be a rapture, a translation of the saints, which means the act of taking a person from one place to another in the twinkling of an eye at the time of the Lord's sudden appearing, there'll be a reunion between believers who have died and believers who are alive and will be caught up, raptured, translated, carried away together in the clouds to meet the Lord. This is what the Bible teaches. So I say, bring it on, swing low, sweet chariot. By the way, why do they sing the African-American spiritual swing low, sweet chariot about the rapture at rugby football games? Well, the Rugby Football Union decided to find out how a song rooted in slavery and yearning for Jesus to appear became an anthem for rugby fans. And I discovered several explanations on YouTube. Swing Low Sweet Chariot is a spiritual, a genre of song created by Africans who were enslaved in the United States. And spirituals were created as an oral tradition that imparted Christian values while also describing the hardships of slavery. Well, England's supporters were rumored to have adopted the song because of its beautiful melody. A group of schoolboys began singing it at Twickenham in 1988, and it just caught on, although others claim the rugby anthem was sung earlier than that date. Well, Swing Low Sweet Chariot was composed by a slave named Wallace Willis, together with his wife Minerva, in the mid-1800s, and it's part of a group of spirituals that say, Lord, just come and take me home right now. Another spiritual by Wallace Willis became quite famous. Steal away to Jesus, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. The lyrics of Swing Low Sweet Chariot refers to a Bible episode recorded in the Hebrew Scriptures in 2 Kings chapter 2 when God's chariots of fire came down to earth and suddenly snatched away the prophet Elijah to heaven without dying, which is, of course, a picture and a type of the rapture. Elijah and his understudy, the prophet Elisha, had just crossed over the Jordan River, 
when, according to verse 11, as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire with horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up into heaven in a whirlwind. The chariot swung low to collect Elijah and his mantle fell down upon Elisha, one of my favorite Bible stories. Well, today... I live in England and Israel, but I was born in America, and we used to sing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot in churches and in summer campgrounds, and the first stanza goes like this. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me, coming for to carry me home. And then the chorus, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot coming for to take me home. Well, it's vital to know that you're ready to go with Jesus should he suddenly swing down low into the atmosphere and call you up with a trumpet of God and separate you from this world in the rapture. It could happen at any time that he should appear. And if you're not sure you're ready, it could be that there's sin in your life and your conscience is not clear. So I always urge you to stay repentant up. Now, from my childhood, I've experienced dreams about the rapture, even before I knew the name of the doctrine. And the doctrine of the rapture is found in both testaments of the Bible. Just as Elijah's mantle fell on Elisha when Elijah was suddenly taken to glory, so the gospel torch will fall back into the hands of the Jewish people when the church of true believers worldwide is suddenly removed. Therefore, God's present work of the restoration of the nation of Israel should alert every born-again believer that the hour is very late. But an untruth is being erroneously circulated in many churches, a lie which undermines what the Bible calls our blessed hope, which is the imminent appearing of our Lord and Savior in the clouds. The lie that's being taught is that the sudden appearance of the Lord to seize his bride, the true church, is a relatively new doctrine. But no, the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture is not new. It's always been in the Bible. And if you ignore this truth, you may be tempted to be watching for the Antichrist rather than watching for the sudden appearance of the Lord Jesus. And you may not be ready like the foolish virgins in his parable of the ten virgins, the wise and foolish virgins, found in Matthew chapter 25. In an effort to demean the doctrine of the rapture, a smokescreen arose claiming that a Scottish girl in the 19th century just prophesied the doctrine and that it was later popularized by Bible expositor James Nelson Darby. But long before Darby lived, The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Brethren, I wouldn't have you to be ignorant. Ignorant about what? He said, Don't be ignorant that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the resurrected dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we forever be with the Lord. Therefore, Paul said, Comfort one another with these words. So the biblical doctrine of believers being caught up in the clouds at the sudden appearing of Jesus is supposed to be a comfort to every believer. The mysterious event known as the rapture will be the turning point in the end times, and the world will never be the same afterwards. You see, when the restraining influence of the true believers, the salt and the light, is gone, the Antichrist will be able quickly to set up a global dictatorship And he'll require a mark on the right hand or forehead in order for people to buy or sell. And if you miss the rapture, beware of taking the mark of the beasts. Sadly, many preachers and websites deny the pre-tribulation rapture and they're sowing confusion in the body of Messiah. But thankfully, many brilliant and able Bible teachers have written books about the Bible doctrine known as the pre-tribulation rapture. And I believe my friend Derek Walker, pastor of the Oxford Bible Church, has written the best overall explanation of the subject. I'm very grateful for the many insights I've gained from his books over the years, and I'm delighted that Pastor Derek is offering a new ebook on Amazon called The Pre-Tribulation Rapture. 
a concept the world must grasp about this Bible truth. I'm very happy that I received permission from Pastor Derek to mention a section of his ebook that outlines 20 differences that the Bible teaches between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus. And I hope by sharing these now, any confusion will be cleared up. Number one, in the rapture, the New Testament teaches that Jesus returns to the air, but at the second coming, he comes to the earth. Number two, the rapture is described as a joyous reunion of the dead in Messiah being reunited with those who are still living as we're caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord. But the second coming is described in the Bible as a time of terrible judgment. Today, unbelievers and mockers attack the biblical truth that this world, this universe is coming to an end and it will be destroyed by the return of Jesus. But don't listen to their mockery. The third difference the Bible teaches between the rapture and the second coming is that in the rapture, Jesus is seen only by believers. But at the second coming, he's universally seen by everybody. Number four, in the rapture, Jesus comes secretly as a thief in the night. But at the second coming, he comes openly in manifested power and great glory. Number five, in the rapture, Jesus comes as a bridegroom. But at the second coming, he returns as the king of kings, lord of lords, and judge of all. Number six, in the rapture, Jesus comes for his bride, but at the second coming, he comes with his bride, riding on the white horses. Number seven, in the rapture, he removes believers from the earth by translation. In the second coming, he removes unbelievers from the earth by death. Number eight, the rapture triggers the period in Bible history known as the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. On the other hand, the second coming brings in the millennium, the thousand year rule of Messiah and the time of Israel's full restoration. Number nine, in the rapture, Jesus comes as the morning star, which heralds the soon coming new day, only seen by those watching and those who are awake. But at the second coming, he comes as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, bringing in a new day the rays of his glory shining upon the whole earth. Number 10 difference between the rapture and the second coming. The rapture is always imminent and signless, but the second coming is preceded by many signs, including, of course, the Antichrist. This next one, number 11, is an important distinction. Please get this. The rapture is related to the church, and the second coming is related to Israel and all the nations. Number 12, the rapture is described in the New Testament as a mystery, but the second coming is revealed even in the Hebrew scriptures, the prophecies in the Old Testament. Number 13, at the rapture, all believers must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but at the second coming, all the surviving Gentiles will be judged. Number 14, at the time of the rapture, Israel's everlasting covenants will still remain unfulfilled. But at the second coming, Israel's eternal covenants will finally all be fulfilled. Hallelujah. Number 15, this is important for all those worried about climate change. After the rapture, the earth will be unchanged. But after the second coming, the earth will be restored, renovated. 16, after the rapture, evil and the Antichrist will be released. But at the second coming, evil and the Antichrist will be judged. 17. The rapture comes before the day of the Lord's wrath. The second coming is the climax and conclusion of that day. Difference number 18 between the rapture and the second coming. Life before the rapture will be going on as normal. Men will be saying peace and safety buying and selling, giving in marriage. But in the great tribulation, just before the second coming, things on earth will be at their worst ever. 
Number 19, the rapture is for believers only. The second coming is for all on the earth. And number 20 of Pastor Derek Walker's list, all replacement theologians, please take note of this. The rapture is the expectation of the church described by the Apostle Paul as their blessed hope of being taken to heaven. But the second coming is the expectation of Israel, her earthly hope of inheriting the messianic kingdom. Amen. Well, it's important for you to know that according to Jesus, judgments and catastrophes during the Great Tribulation will be unparalleled like nothing that's ever happened before in history, no matter how horrific. And that's why Jesus told us in Luke 21, 36, to be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Does your worldview envision climate change is bringing about the apocalypse? Or do you know that God himself is going to renovate this world by fire, as the Bible teaches? Bible believers also must take on board as part of our worldview a concept mentioned in the scripture called the millennium. And this will be a thousand years when the, after the tribulation when Jesus rules the earth in righteousness and Jerusalem will be the worship capital of the world. Eternity is part of a biblical worldview. The book of Revelation pulls back the curtain and reveals the future glorious scene in heaven before the throne of God when believers from all nations will be gathered together to worship the one true God. The text says, I beheld a great multitude which no man could number from all nations, kindreds, peoples, languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white with palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and might. Be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. My parents are already there, part of that great song and throng. I look forward to seeing them again, but let's not forget the challenge of Romans 10, 13 that says in the New Testament, only those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I urge you to put your faith and trust in the world's only Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah. Yeshua is his Hebrew name. I earnestly pray that every person watching or listening to this broadcast, I pray for protection upon your life in this fragile world, for your health and healing, and for maximum blessings, including household salvation. And to help you in your walk with God, we offer a library of free video teachings at our website, exploits.tv, where you can also catch up on details about our upcoming anointed prayer conferences and adventures in the Holy Land and elsewhere. If you've been helped by this program or our website, please share with me through the social media. And we also invite you to download our free Jerusalem Channel app from your app store. It has information about our videos, ebooks, and a Bible reading plan. Until next time, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Dark. Shalom and Maranatha. It only happens once in a decade, so please don't miss one of the world's great theatrical events, the historic Passion Play in Oberammergau, Germany. My husband Peter and I will be leading this week-long tour in September and exploring some of Europe's great cities that inspired the Protestant Reformation and will end in the Bavarian Alpine village of Oberammergau to witness the five-hour reenactment of the trial, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. The Passion Play was first performed in 1634 when the villagers staged the event in thanks to God for sparing them from an outbreak of bubonic plague. This year will be only the 42nd time the tradition is carried out. We'll begin the tour on September 16 in the city of Prague. This will include an overnight stay to visit some of the city's historic Jewish sites, and then the chapel where 
Reformation leader Jan Hus preached. Then our private coach takes us first to Leipzig, the city of Johann Sebastian Bach, and then to Wittenberg, where Martin Luther lit the fires of the Reformation. At every stop, you'll meet expert local guides to take you through the monasteries, churches, castles, and homes of some of the great personalities who shaped European culture and faith. We'll also engage in prayers about anti-Semitism and believe that putting our feet in these places will make a difference. On day seven of the tour, we arrive in Oberammergau to experience the Passion Play and overnight in one of the village's charming hotels. There's much more to this special week from the 16th to the 23rd of September. To find out all details, visit our events page of our website at exploits.tv. We do have very limited space left, so please book early, and we'll look forward to spending a great week together. Hope to see you in Oberammergau!